It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. I cannot believe how much content there is in this show today. You are going to be truly amazed. A couple of things that are coming up is an interview uh, with Aaron Adair, one of the co-authors of a book about aliens and religion, right? Oh my gosh, are we going to have some fun with that? Um, I also have a little behind the scenes, a little industry information uh, about the SEC and how they've pursued some large companies for uh, off-channel communication, I think is the phrase that they use. And then, of course, I'm going to give you a little story about uh, I went to a car dealership with the intent of buying a car. It did not go well. Other fun things going on, of course, is the political campaigning season has started And uh, I don't know, 15 Republicans have showed up at the Iowa State Fair and they're prancing around Iowa. Um, And of course, uh, the one who shall not be named showed up. And of course, he is about to get indicted in Georgia, his fourth indictment. I can only hope that one of them progresses far enough and sticks and or some of the um, Republican uh, base comes to the actual realization of reality that he's a criminal. I mean, just years ago, uh, hundreds, there's hundreds and hundreds of things that he's done that any one of them would disqualify almost anyone from any political position or any job in the public and and any major corporation and the entire country would turn against you. uh, As an example, calling the state of Georgia and saying, all I need you to do is find 11,270 more votes for me because we know we won. Wow. That that phone call, the fact that you made that phone call, let alone the content, that phone call is a disqualifying event. Uh, Of course, like I said, there's been hundreds, if not thousands of those in the previous four or five, six years. Uh, Donald Trump should not even be in consideration. He should be struggling to stay out of prison, Actually, no, he should be in prison. That's that's where he should be. Anyway, enough of that rant. Uh, some fun news. Uh, well, I guess I don't know about fun. Uh, Florida. Florida. It's August. August 23 in Florida. My God, is it hot here. Uh, one of my theories, one of the things that I looked for when picking a state to move to Uh, Of course, in Florida, we do have some family, and I might even have more family in the next couple of years in the state of Florida. Another factor for me, of course, was uh, 0% state income, which is very, very handy to have. And maybe it shouldn't even be this way, but, you know, it is this way. And I have a fiduciary responsibility to myself to reduce my taxes where legally possible without getting too carried away. Of course, the political climate in the state is atrocious and it needs my help, right? It it needs a whole bunch of people um, to move in and or some of us somehow to convince voters to change and, and vote a different direction. So we'll see how that goes in the future here in Florida. And of course, one of the things that I looked about, looked at, because uh, Texas was on our list of possible places with, I think, 0% income tax and Las Vegas as well, but those places, and it's going to get worse in the summer, uh, get exceedingly hot. And uh, sometimes, especially in central Texas, it can get exceedingly cold, not often for a long period of time, but cold weather was another one of the reasons I wanted to move south. And my thought process was that with the Atlantic on one side of Florida and the Gulf of Mexico on the other side of Florida, 
having that much water reasonably close, 90 miles uh, from the middle where we are, uh, would have a cooling effect. The water would be cooler than the air and help us not have as high a temperatures. Now, to be fair, we've hit 99 and 100, and I think something like five of the last eight days set all-time record daily highs for that date. So we have our global warming. It's now. It's no longer in the future. It is now. And maybe there is some cooling because I know a lot of friends in places like Alabama, Louisiana, um, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, they're all having record highs that are well above 100, 105, 110, 115. Uh, so, you know, 100, 100 degrees compared to 110 doesn't seem that awful. The humidity, of course, here is uh, quite uh, modest. I'm not, well, moderate? No, no, high. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for, quite high. But, uh, you know, we go out and we swim in the pool and then we stay inside. Uh, sometimes we go places. We try to keep our exposure to the outdoors limited. And of course, what I really should be doing is for most of July and August and maybe a couple weeks in September, plan better so that uh, next year I'm not in central Florida myself when it's hot like this. Uh, maybe uh, maybe uh, Lake Como in Italy would be a better choice uh, to see you know the summer from, or even at that regard, Chicago, which of course has its own record highs. So the weather's gotten hotter everywhere. And of course, the horrifically tragic incidents in Hawaii where fires got whipped by apparently a, a hurricane and uh, people, um, a lot of people died. So, you know, I, I hope uh, they can make the best out of it and people can rebuild their lives. But that's that's pretty tragic. And my little suffering of being a few degrees too hot is nothing. Oh, <laughs> For anyone who's thinking, yes, the pool is hot. <laughs> uh, I don't put a cover on it. It uh, is evaporating some. And uh, we try to swim first thing in the morning when the pool might be only 89. Because by late afternoon, it's often 91 to 93 degrees. I've also thought about getting uh, some kind of solar powered device that could uh, charge up in the morning. And then you know create a fountain or a fan and kind of blow water into the air, which would cause a little more evaporation. And maybe that could take a few degrees off the pool if you run it all day, every day, or at least as much as you can with a little solar panel that it might have. Anywho, enough of that quick break. And then we're going to go into all that fantastic stuff I just told you about. So don't go anywhere. <laughs> This is atheism in a nutshell. You say um, uh, there's a God. I say, can you prove that? You say no. I say I don't believe you then. Mm -hmm. So um, you believe in one God, I assume? Uh, in three persons, but go ahead. Okay, so you believe... Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but there, there are about 3,000 to choose from that have been, you know, people who believe in... I've done time. some reading, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so basically, you deny... One less God than I do. You don't believe in 2,999 gods, uh -huh. and I don't believe in just one more. Right. <laughs> the Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. This is a bit of uh, industrial behind-the-scenes information. It is uh, on a topic of, uh, what did they call it here, uh, off-channel communication. So every once in a while, one of my clients will contact me through some non-standard new form of communication and this might be you dear listener and i'll say no don't do this send me an email because you may not know this but registered investment advisors money managers brokerage firms all these different companies 
they are required to keep to back up to have all of this communication for if they ever get audited. And so the feds or the state agencies may say, hey, uh, we're auditing you. We're looking at this and we want access to all of your communi- client communication for the last couple of years. So uh, also I have software where at least I log phone calls in and out and the kind of the basic content of the conversation. But apparently the SEC is on a on a bender here and they have uh, charged so far $2.5 billion, with a B, $2.5 billion in fees for companies not following the rules. Uh, JP Morgan, as an example, uh, settled for a $200 million fine. Uh, let's see here. Uh, other organizations totaled of $1.8 billion, uh, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, UBS, Citigroup Global Markets, Goldman Sachs, Credit, Credit Suisse Securities, Wells Fargo, BNP, BMO, Raymond James, uh, Stiefel Financial, LPL Financial, and now currently under investigation have not been settled. Uh, Robin Hood Markets, Voya Financial, um, and I'm sure there's others. I'm just kind of skimming this to make sure I got everything that's mentioned in this article anyway. But it is something where they're supposed to keep this. And what has happened is with the dramatic expansion of more social media, more ways to communicate with people, some of which might be very easy to use. Uh, and they're talking about uh, Twitter, AKA X, fuck Elon, um, WhatsApp, uh, other methods where advisors are talking to clients and there's communication going back and forth, and none of that is logged, none of that is tracked, none of that is maintained. And so if there's questions about, hey, why did you happen to recommend this specific stock one day before it collapsed or one day before they announced that they're going to get approved uh, to release this medicine to treat cancer or something like that, those records aren't being kept. So they're getting slapped. <laughs> pretty hard uh two point uh what was it 2.5 yeah 2.5 billion in fines so far um and also a lot of it was um advisors brokers um insurance people doing all of this on their personal equipment not the company issued equipment and there's there's no tracking or logging of the communications back and forth whatsoever so that is something that uh, the sec is currently looking at one of many things, but I thought I'd share that with you. And if nothing else, just for my own benefit a little, because every once in a while, someone will contact me as they say off channel. And I'll say, please, please, please only send me emails. Um, and then I, like I said, I log calls and all the emails are backed up and stored in case somebody wants to look at them. And that's one of the driving motivations for me to do that. It's also nice because I don't want to go check 10 different places to see who has contacted me or sent me a message somewhere. But, you know, a little bit of fun uh, about the industry and what the Securities and Exchange Commission is currently doing. Hope you enjoy. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Jesus says that he speaks in parables because the people, they just don't understand anything else. But the parables are often foggy and meaningless, and Jesus is snippy when even the disciples don't get them. He says to them, if you don't understand this parable, then how can you understand any parable? And are you incapable of understanding? I kept thinking, don't teach in parables then. It's not working. Even your staff doesn't understand them. Why don't you just say what you mean? Okay, so Jesus isn't so patient, and I think he picked a very ineffective lesson-giving technique, and he's angry most of the time, but that doesn't make him bad. It's just, wow, I really expected someone else. Some of the parables are not just foggy. To me, they're sort of offensive. Like in Luke, Jesus helps us understand God's relationship with humans by telling us a story about how God treats people the way people 
treat their slaves. They beat some more than they beat others. Okay, I know this was a different time and everything, and I really tried to keep that in mind as the Bible refers to slavery all over the place. And not only does it not say it's wrong, I mean, the Bible gives you advice about how you're supposed to keep your slaves and how slaves should behave obediently at all times to their masters. But I don't know, I guess I sort of thought the Son of God would say slavery was wrong. But no, Jesus does not say that. In fact, he uses slavery as an example of how God treats people. It was really hard to stay on Jesus' side when he started saying really aggressive, just hateful things. Like in Luke chapter 21, Jesus says that he is like a king who says, anyone who does not recognize me, bring them here and slaughter them before me. Or in John chapter 15, Jesus says, anyone who does not believe in me is like a withered branch that will be cast into the fire and burned. In Matthew, he says, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. And in Luke, he says, and if you don't have a sword, Sell your clothes and buy one. (laughs) Then Jesus just starts acting downright crazy. Like in Matthew chapter 21, when this fig tree doesn't have a fig for Jesus to eat, he condemns the fig tree to death. That's right, Jesus condemns a fig tree to death. Not a parable, by the way, just Jesus pissed off that the fig tree didn't have a fig for him to eat when he wanted one. (laughs) Not exactly the Prince of Peace who taught us to turn the other cheek. family. I have to say that for me, the most deeply upsetting thing about Jesus is his family values, which is amazing when you think how there's so many groups out there who say they base their family values on the Bible. I mean, he seems to have no real close ties to his parents. He puts his mother off cruelly over and over again. At the wedding feast, he says to her, woman, what have I to do with you? And once while he was speaking to a crowd, Mary waited patiently off to the side to talk to him. And Jesus said to the disciples, send her away because you are my family now. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell this exact same story, but Mark actually tells us why Mary was there to see Jesus. He says Mary came to see Jesus to restrain him because the people were saying he's gone out of his mind. I kept thinking, yes, let's go get Jesus and get him some help. I tried to buy a car. No, really, I did. I went to a dealership which maybe was my mistake. But the funny thing, in the past couple of years, um, it worked out pretty well. Although, as I'm thinking about it, two of the three last times I've bought a car, it was all arranged in advance. Uh, We got my wife's car from the state of New York, and we lived in the Chicago area a couple of years ago. And so that all had to be done before we we even went over. And many years ago when I bought a Prius Prime where you could plug it in and get some range uh, out of electricity, that was arranged too before we went to buy it because those were really hard to find also. And of course, the uh, electric car, the, the Chevy Bolt, um, I saw a internet ad, did a screen print, went to the dealership and said, what do I actually pay? And they said, that price is what we charge people. And the manager came over and I said, but what about all the other add-ins? And so he sat down and calculated the tax, title, license, no no doc fee, put the total at the bottom of the sheet of paper and signed it. And I was like, okay, well, gosh, that just took a few minutes. I'll take it. Uh, It was a great price, by the way. And thank goodness, because apparently the trade-in value on my Bolt is going to be kind of low. Um, part of the reason is that the car I bought is now a good $10,000 less to uh, to buy because they've gotten cheaper, which I'm, I'm all for in the long run. And there's a $7,500 rebate that for a while had gone away. And of course, the supply for cars in the market has gotten better. So there's more cars. So we'll see how that works out. But a couple of days ago, I did go to a dealership, as I said at the beginning. The dealership had, I found out during the process, um, $7,000 of dealer add-ons. $7,000. Now, I know at some point they were telling me what they were, 
and I picked up a few of them, but my brain was so in shock that I couldn't uh, couldn't process uh, after that. But apparently they they pre tinted all the windows. They put on a ceramic coat uh, for the car. They sprayed the undercarriage with something. They did this. They did that. They did four or five other things. Probably even put nitrogen in the tires for you for five hundred extra dollars. But when I heard there was seven thousand dollars of dealer add-ons, I kind of glitched. <laughs> so I'm I'm not sure a hundred percent what followed after that because um, that seemed so inappropriate, fraudulent that uh, I, I pretty much knew I was I was done. And of course, uh, a few lines later in this document was the uh, the offer for my two cars. I was trading in the Bolt and uh, the 2003 Honda, no, Toyota Sienna minivan that we had, which has been a beast, still rides incredibly well. But uh, here in Florida, it's costing me $800 every six months for insurance on that car, a 20 year old car. And when I called the insurance company, they said, it doesn't really matter the price of the car that much. I mean, it, it matters a little bit, but all of their claims are expensive claims are from liability, medical bills, uh, attorneys and uninsured motorists and possibly weather damage and or flooding. So the value of the car per se was not really material. So I didn't want to pay $1,600 to sit on a 20 year old vehicle that occasionally, while very, very amazing at uh, hauling people and stuff around, um, generally just sat there and waited for something to break in the, in the street. So uh, that was the plan to trade these two in. It didn't go well. Um, I can safely say I'll, I'll never be going back to that dealership, and that might be the way they're going to want it as well. So uh, I will talk more about other visits if I go. And uh, the point of this was not to talk about the specifics of the car I'm looking at, but the wackiness that uh, some dealers can do to try to get seven, eight, maybe even ten or twelve thousand dollars extra out of someone through all the games that they play. Now, there are dealers, and I've been to them where they just they're straight up and they give you a reasonably good, maybe okay deal. It, it's still a tough time to buy a new car because they're they're coming off the high from just a year ago where they were marking up cars five and ten thousand dollars over MSRP. And clearly that's not flying anymore. So they gotta make up something else. But thought I'd share that with you and I'll probably talk about more of that. More of that or more about that subject in the next episode or two. So we'll get on with the rest of the show. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. Okay, everybody, I've got a fun one for you. You're going to love it. In just a minute, we're going to start talking to Aaron Adair, and he is one of the co-authors on a brand new book, Aliens and Religion, Where Two Worlds Collide, But wait, there's more to the title. Assessing the impact of discovering extraterrestrial intelligence on religion and theology. Aaron, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And you remind me with that long of a title. That's the reason it can't be an audiobook. Run out of breath. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I, I did what I had to do. I, I got the Kindle version and I made myself physically read something for a change instead of paying people to read to me. Uh it wasn't painful or anything. It just, uh, I'm not used to it. Um, went really smooth, well-written, fun, interesting. We'll, we'll tease some of it, but we'll we'll give away some secrets, but they still have to want more so they can go buy it, right? Get, that way you can get 50 cents or something out of it. Uh, from the Kindle, it's going to be something like in that range, yeah. order of magnitude. And since I do astronomy stuff, order of magnitude is all I ever work with. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Well, I, I once was talking to a, uh, a Christian that said something about the earth being millions of years old. And, and I said billions, but uh, you know, that's only what, three orders of magnitude error? Uh, yeah. So yeah, three orders of magnitude, but you know, three orders of magnitude between friends, that's fine. Well, yeah, well, I was thinking uh, three orders of magnitude error coming from a Christian, I, I was pretty impressed. 
Mm-hmm. So, because mm-hmm. I would I would normally expect them to say ten thousand years, but 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 they didn't. Uh, we have a lot of fun stuff to go over in the book, and like I said, I don't want to ruin all of it, but I do want to cover two important things just in summary, because I bet a lot of my listeners are going to know this, so we don't want to spend too much time on it. We, I want to get into the meaty part after that. Mm-hmm. But the the two things, there is the Drake equation, mm-hmm. uh, which probably everybody has heard of. Uh, you know, real quick summary on that. And then I don't know how to pronounce the name, the Karskov scale, is it? Uh, the, uh, yeah, Karloshev scale. Karloshev. I knew I, knew I had it wrong. Uh, after we get done with the Drake equation, I, I'd love to have a little bit on that, and particularly what uh, you and Jonathan thought about what what is likely and possible as far as who's on who's where on that scale. I'd, I'd love to do that. Mm-hmm. But Drake equation, what the hell is that? All right, yeah. So uh, this was a way to try to estimate how many neighbors do we have in this little place that we call the Milky Way galaxy? We know it's astronomical in size, and not just to be a joke, but the fact that our best estimates of the size of the Milky Way galaxy is that it's over 100,000 light years across, with it on the order of 400 billion stars, with a B, billion. And you realize, okay, there's lots and lots of places that we think life could potentially harbor. Well, can we make any sort of educated guesses on how many neighbors we might actually have that are actively out there that we could potentially pick up with our technology? So Frank Drake is coming up with this um, very back of the envelope sort of way of calculating in the early 1960s and coming up with say, hey, here are the factors that we think would go into making a reasonable guess into how many active civilizations, advanced civilizations there are in the Milky Way. And so the main factors are in there are what's the rate of star formation. So basically kind of giving an idea of how many new places could come into place for a civilization to grow. What fraction of those stars actually have planets and how many of those planets around a star will actually be life bearing? What fraction of those habitable worlds actually will go and develop life? What fraction of the life-bearing worlds will actually develop intelligence? And what fraction of those intelligent worlds will actually build things like radio telescopes or radio transmitters so we could potentially pick them up? And lastly, how long does such a civilization like that last? Five minutes? Five billion years? Uh, That will have a big determination to this value N, which is the number of civilizations in the Milky Way. Um, Now, depending on who you talk to, you can get values of millions to zero which yeah. means hopefully at least uh, one i mean i mean one yeah, yeah um we know there's at least one in the milky way but uh yeah. a value of zero would basically say that we are alone not just in the milky way but potentially the entire observable universe which makes the whole universe a pretty lonely place with uh just us to muck it up yeah and I- like i say uh, the fact that a lot of scientists don't agree on what those values should be was actually one of the um, starting things of like, okay, what can we actually do to put in better approximations of those values? So I think we did a reasonably good job of trying to simulate our uncertainties better than most other papers. And it would suggest that very confident that we have neighbors in the observable universe, but just 50-50 if we have neighbors in the Milky Way galaxy. And that's important because if they're in the Milky Way, there's at least some chance that we might be able to ever detect them and communicate with them yeah. without taking a billion years. And, and of course, one of the interesting things to get technical with the uh, size and shape and theoretical black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, mm-hmm. uh, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stars in the middle. But oh yes, <laughs> there they're probably going to have a harder time having a life-sustaining planet for very long because of the proximity of other stars and or the black hole or black holes that circle around each other at the center. Um, So you're saying within the Milky Way, 50-50. 
Yeah, yeah. And as you say, like towards the middle of the galaxy, um, less because of the black holes, but more that that region was probably subject to more supernovae and they're kind of crammed together. And when you have a supernova going off, you basically have the biggest bomb in the universe going off next to your civilization. That could be hazardous. So yeah. there is at least more existential risk for civilizations there than out in the uh, regions that we happen to live in, like the outer third of the Milky Way. But again, these are still very uncertain because what are the factors necessary for life? It's, you know, a bit uncertain. And it's also the case that supernovae also give off the heavier elements. So it could be the case, you know, there might be supernovae going off to these planets, but they also give them the elements they need to create advanced civilizations. Because like, oh, we got now a, you know, a big slug of iron that we can build a, a Dyson sphere out of or anything else. So it's kind of hard to know what the trade-offs, trade-offs are because... We haven't had a chance to talk to them about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have a very good sample size to go from. Uh, and exactly. of course, the other thing, uh, while we're doing the Drake equation, l let's just assume there's one other, just just for, for laughs for this conversation. What would be the uh, estimated distance? I mean, if, if there's us and there's one other randomly distributed somewhere within the Milky Way, are we talking about... 50,000 light years, give or take 40,000 light years. Uh, I would need to do the math to be careful about it, but yeah, something on the order of tens of thousands of light years, at least. Um, I basically it'd be a 50, 50 chance if they would be on the same side of the galaxy as us, as the opposite side. And just so everyone knows the shape of our galaxy is roughly spiral. Like it's roughly um, like a flat disc. So if you're imagining it as a circle um, and you're just flipping a coin, there's a chance that you're on the left side or the right side of that circle. Um, and if we're on the left side, 50-50 chance that they're on the same side as us. If they're on the opposite side, then yeah, they are at least 50,000 light years away. Yeah, yeah. of course, if they're on the opposite, literal opposite side, uh, we would never ever be able to even find or communicate with them because you'd have to go through the galactic center. Um, but even something that's close, like, I don't know, 10,000 light years that would mean that to send a signal, assuming it didn't degrade through the vastness of space and didn't get blocked by dark bodies or dark matter or a dust cloud, uh, it would take us 10,000 years each way to, to chat. Is that right? Yeah. And it's also the case that when we're sending those signals, the, the bit rate of the data we're sending will also be pathetically slow. So... Um, take a 56K modem, dunk it in water, and that might be about the speed that we're going to send data <laughs> to the cosmos. It's uh, the, the fact that as your, sequel, or your signal gets weaker and weaker, the less data that you can transmit confidently. It's kind of like if you're at a party and it's really loud, not only do you have to talk louder, but you also have to talk slower for people around you to understand. It's kind of a similar thing with radio, that the louder things are, the slower you're going to be able to confidently get your signal out there and have it understood. Absolutely amazing. Now, we also threw out, and I've forgotten the name already, and you'll remind us. That's okay. What's this this scale, technological scale thing? And, of course, we have to mention that it is uh, exponential. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is the Kardashev scale. And so um, the name comes from a Russian astronomer in the mid-1960s. And also thinking in these sort of sci-fi ways, like, hey, how would we actually – talk about how advanced such a alien society would be. And of course, where might we be on the scale? And the ways he was imagining is, okay, imagine a civilization that was on a planet like Earth and had control of all of the energy resources that would be on the surface of the Earth. So na namely, imagining you could collect all the solar energy landing on the surface and use it to whatever ends you are. That would be considered a Kardashev one scale civilization. Now, Kardashev 1, all right, that sounds like a fair bit of energy. Once you go to Kardashev 2, uh, this is you now have the ability of controlling all of the energy coming out of the neighboring star. And to do this, you'd have to have some sort of mega project that would basically have to build, you know, could imagine almost solar panels around the entire star. And this would has been called a uh, Dyson sphere or Dyson swarm um, after the American physicist uh, Freeman Dyson uh, first coming up with that idea. Now, going from just the light that happens to land on the surface of your planet to every single photon leaving a star is more than a factor of a trillion 
more energy. So going from Kardashev 1 to Kardashev 2 is actually a big jump. Uh And, well, we can actually keep jumping. And so theoretically, you could imagine a Kardashev 3 scale that doesn't control just the energy of one star, but literally all the stars in a galaxy, which is on the order of hundreds of billions of stars. So you could even go beyond that and start imagining multi-galaxy civilizations and there's ways of extending it, but we can also extend in the opposite direction. And this was actually done first by Carl Sagan who realized, Hey, the, the jumps between Kardashev one, two, and three, if you put it on a log scaling, it actually is a fairly even scaling and you can work it out and say, Oh, and here us lowly humans right now, we are approximately a Kardashev 0.7. So not a one civilization. Now you'd say, Hey, 0.7, that sounds close to one. We're yeah. within a rounding error of that civilization but because it's a logarithmic scale it gets a little bit confusing where literally to go from our current level to kardashev one we would have to have energy production increase by a factor of about a thousand so i'm not talking about building a thousand more coal plants i'm saying every single power plant we have building a thousand more per plant we have which is not feasible we're not going to burn that much coal that much wood um to produce that kind of civilization and if we did we'd be done in five minutes <laughs> yeah yeah i was gonna say it it sounds like we're talking about homeopathy but in reverse um yeah because <laughs> the, the way they dilute you know tens of thousands and and you if you add uh let us see if you add six zeros it's not 60 times or 600 times it's millions and millions of times what you already have. So like you said, it's not, we would need a thousand more plants. We would need a thousand more plants for power plants for each plant we currently have. That's a lot. (laughs) Uh, Exactly. Yeah. Would we, so either we're going to develop fusion power, some sort of other energy, um, or we're just never going to reach that kind of scale. It requires a fundamentally advanced form of energy production. Yeah. Then just burning a bunch of dinosaur juice. Would, would we have, on earth uh, enough raw materials to even build a dyson sphere has someone done the math on that um i haven't done the math but from what i would think is that most uh ideas out there for building a dyson swarm is the idea is that first we actually have to take the raw material and pretty much completely tear apart the planet Mercury. Mercury happens to have like this really big iron core. It's basically iron with a bunch of dirt on top of it. Yeah. So ideas first go there and mine out all that iron and turn that into um, uh, reflectors to build a swarm of probes all orbiting the sun and reflecting light to the needed places. So step one is basically disassemble an entire planet. Yeah, yeah, that 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 sounds like that might take some energy t- as well. Um, yes, and yeah. and of course you have the potential problem that if you are on the sunny side, because uh, I think mm-hmm. Mercury, from my memory, is, is it tidal tidal lock? Yes, it is tidally locked, and it has no atmosphere. So yeah, the sunny side is extremely hot, and the dark, you know, the other side is of course, um, yeah, you know, quite uh, so- chilled. So, yeah, you put your solar panels on one side, maybe have your civilization or uh, whatever workers on the edge where there's at least a modicum of temperature control. Well, I was wondering if anyone, there must be some science fiction book uh, for a, a planet like that, assuming it had an atmosphere where people could only live on the line that goes around the planet that sees the sun only on the horizon. Uh, it would it would be fixed, but very low. So you get you get energy, but not too much because you don't want to be too cold and you don't want to be too hot. And how I would envision it is that that the closer to that line, that perfect line, that perfect balance, the richer you must be to have property there. And so as you go further into the sunlight or further into the darkness, the land value gets cheaper and cheaper, but it becomes much harder to live. Has anyone ever done that? They must so have. I'm thinking back in one of the novels of Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Rendezvous with Rama, there are people working on Mercury in that novel, though he didn't have any class structure there. So it'd be interesting to see if someone has done that. But on the other hand, I'm thinking that may not be a good prospect simply because um, even if it is tidally locked, it may not be so perfectly locked that it might still have a little bit of like rolling back and forth a little bit. So sometimes those 
um, cities on the edge of light and shadow will go back and forth between more light and more shadow. Uh Um, There's a similar thing with the moon, that the rotation rate is slightly off, so there's a little bit of wiggle, and uh, that could mean that it's like, oh, right now it's just fine, but then, you know, it rotates one extra degree and you're cooked, or (laughs) rotates the other degree and um, now you, you know, can't read a book. And you've lost all your power because you're depending on solar power. Yeah, yeah. Of course, it, since it's science fiction, it could be some uh, some body around a different star that that is perfect. Yeah. But uh, if if anyone knows, I w- I would love to to do that. So send me an email. Um, so we have this scale. We we know where we are. Uh, and of course, we on Earth we wouldn't necessarily have to build. And of course. The, the farther out the sphere is, the more material you would need to have. But if you go too close, then the material is going to get probably too hot. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about just, and maybe this is the swarm thing you're talking about. How about some solar collecting panels in, I think they're called Lagrange points? Or, or does that make sense? Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, though, to really, really build this swarm, you would actually want to have basically a panel um, blocking out every path that sunlight would go. So you would actually have some panels effectively at the north and south poles of the sun and around the equator and everything else in between. You want to capture all of that light. Right, so but they'd I mean, all be I mean you, orbiting. You, you don't get the entire Dyson sphere on day one. I mean, right? You would you would start somewhere. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, don't... that's a that's a good engineering question that I don't know the answer to very well. And it also would depend on where that energy needs to go. So in particular, um, I would think that the way you would want to do it is like, you know, suppose we're disassembling mercury. Um, you're, the process is slow there and it gets, you know, whatever energy it can. The first um, uh, reflector goes out and what does it do? It's going to reflect its energy back to mercury so they have more energy to work with their mining. Yeah. So they can exponentially ramp that up as they get more and more energy focused to mercury. So that's going to tell you where you need to place those probes in the first place. And, and of course, we wouldn't want to build panels in such a way that they would block the sunlight from reaching the Earth while we're building the Dyson sphere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, the the ultimate sphere better, you know, uh, be outside the orbit of the Earth. Otherwise, uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's going to get a bit cold here. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that could be one way of combating climate change. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, and then of course, I, I do want to talk about uh, how we might find one of these if somebody built one. But before we go into that, my thought was, what if uh, a super powerful situ- uh, civilization built a Dyson sphere, but it was more like a screen in, and not a wall? Mm. Would, would that still have the same effect that you described in the book with the completed Dyson sphere? Yeah, that's basically the idea of the the Dyson Swarm. So it's a whole bunch of individual panels all on their own independent um, orbit rather than locked together because uh, uh, there's fundamental engineering issues with building the, sw- the the sphere where basically you have one failure point and then the whole thing could potentially uh. collapse in on itself, <laughs> which is what we would call a bad design. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's like the debris around the Earth when you launch a satellite. There's more and more bits up there. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So eventually we would, you know, purposely try to create the future imagine in Wally, just having so many probes up in the way that it's almost impossible to navigate through but by blocking all that light you're using it to whatever your purpose is yeah. the thing though is that um whether you've built the sphere or the swarm or something in between you're blocking more and more of that sunlight and you will then only have some waste heat that gets out from there so in any sort of process where you get any sort of work done there is going to be waste heat basically even with solar power, in a sense, there's a tailpipe. And that's actually something we could potentially look for. There is some sort of super advanced civilization that has built even a good fraction of a Dyson swarm. We would actually be able to notice and say, hey, there's this star over here. It's not giving off as much much light as expected. And it seems to be giving off way more infrared than you would expect from a normal star. It's almost like a hump, bunch of waste heat. Oh, crap, waste heat. We got a civilization. Have we seen that yet? No. We, have we looked for that? Yes. But so far, not successfully finding any neighbors that way. And, and of course, if, if a uh, if a civilization was able to control a generous portion of the energy available in a galaxy, we probably would have seen that already. Yeah. Uh, to, to put it mildly, if a civilization controlled uh, most of the Milky Way or all the Milky Way galaxy, they would be here, yeah. and they would yeah. their presence would be 
not just obvious, but probably very interface. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, someone, a, a species, a planet, a organization that is not as far advanced as us, we're probably not going to detect them unless they've been around for millions or billions of years because they're so far away. Yeah, yeah. The fact that uh, whatever they have done, it takes a long time for the information that they have created to get to us is one thing. Um, and if, yeah, all the more so if they're in another galaxy that, yeah, uh, the nearest major galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy is about two and a half million light years away. So if a new advanced civilization was birthed there today, we would not know that that's the case until a geologic age has passed here on earth. Yeah. And of course they would also not see us for two and a half million years because our radio exactly. waves has only been going out, uh, give or take a hundred years. So we have all that fun. Now, one of the themes in the book, and, and it will go to the religion part here in a moment, one of the themes is that without any other knowledge, it seems to be likely probabilistic that we're somewhere in the middle of the spectrum of available societies, cultures, enterprises within the galaxy. Uh, but there's also the possibility that someone that could get to us from another star, you know, uh, 500 light years away, they would have to be considerably more advanced than us because we can't do that. And so what happens when they show up? Uh, and first, you know, what, what could happen when they show up and then we'll segue right into how does that affect religion? If you don't mind. Yeah. So we tried doing some like back of the envelope calculations of seeing, okay, if a civilization could send a mission here, and also supposing they want to get here with um, a little uh, less patience than I have. And when I say patience, I mean if we use current rocket technology to try to get to the nearest star system to Earth, Proxima Centauri, it takes close to 100,000 years to get to the nearest star. Um, I would call that a stupid long trip. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if you really want to get around and do it with any sort of speed and also take advantage of some of the effects from special relativity, you want to go a significant fraction of the speed of light. So um, we did some back of the envelope calculations and said, okay, if a civilization could go and have something the mass of the space shuttle go 87% the speed of light, um, and it shows 87% because that gives you this, uh, what's called the gamma factor of two. In, in special relativity, you get this factor of two of both length contraction and time dilation. Um, and two is a nice number. I like two. Yeah. Um, and basically it's like, okay, if they can put enough energy into something, the mass of the space shuttle, get it here so they can have some relativistic effect, they can get here in something uh, like a plausible amount of time. What kind of civilization could do that? And I realized it had to be more than Kardashev 1 on that scale. So they would have to be well over a thousand times more powerful than us. I think we estimated something like they would be at least a million times more powerful than our current civilization. And when I say civilization, I don't mean just Americans. I don't mean just the West. I mean the entirety of humanity, all of our resources combined. This civilization would be at least a million times more powerful than that. So if they got here, we would have to say, wow, they have energy levels equivalent to forces of nature here on Earth. And <laughs> considering in the past, we literally called the forces of nature gods, they would have earned that <laughs> moniker. It sounds like something out of uh, Stargate SG-1, you know, where, where uh, they're going to have to be on that kind of a scale where they can control full systems, not not necessarily everything about a sun, but a good chunk of it and multiple ones, and they have a bunch of ships. Uh, what are the odds? I know this is just a winger here. Uh, what about warp, warp speed, mm. warp drive technology? Is that going to be a thing? So... There is some interesting theoretical work behind that. So back in the mid-1990s, a, uh, a physicist from the uh, University of Mexico, um, Miguel Alcubier, um, basically took the equations of general relativity, Einstein's general theory, and basically kind of like ran it backwards and said, hey, if I created this sort of weird shape of the space-time continuum, um, what kind of mass distribution would that give me rather than trying to run it the opposite way and said, hey, we can build this work bubble. We just need this kind of material and this sort of quantity. And you could have something that would go any speed you want because 
the the bubble itself, the expansion and contraction of space time that this allowed, didn't have the same uh, speed limits as normal uh, matter. So it's like, oh wow, he literally came up with a warp drive, a way of warping space and time to go faster than light. It was really exciting. People looked at it and said, okay, well, there's a few problems. One was the original energy requirements was more than all the mass energy of the observable universe, uh. which <laughs> is a little bit hard to get onto one ship, put yeah. it mildly. Yeah. yeah. Um, there have been ways to actually modify this so the energy requirements are not so absurd, but they're still not exactly within human engineering in the next you know, X number of years. But the other thing is the kind of energy it needs is something that we don't think exists. Um, it's sometimes called exotic matter. Uh, among the things that it has is that its mass is negative. Now, that might sound weird because it is. Yeah. In particular, if you take negative mass and you plug it just into the most basic equations of motion, it says if you try pushing this mass to the left, it accelerates to the right. Wow. Yeah, that, that's that's that, that's uh, we still got a long way to go on that. <laughs> No, no. Uh, it seems more likely than not that it's actually impossible. One thing is if you actually had negative mass, you could build uh, perpetual motion machines. Uh, and every time that happens, that's a way of your physics saying, no, you did something wrong. Um, well, and, and <laughs> it, it also breaks these other conditions in general relativity called the weak energy condition, which is basically another way of preventing these sorts of absurdities to happen. And also perhaps the most important thing is if you can go faster than light, you can build a time machine and build all of the time paradoxes that come along with that. And uh, nature seems to do a good job to make sure there are not time travelers. Yeah, I, I was just I was just thinking before you even said it. I don't even remember if it was in the book, but if you have uh, negative mass, does that somehow <laughs> open the doors to negative time? And, and maybe that does. Uh, so if we find aliens or they find us, and again, the book has... Uh, as you pointed out, uh, nice lists of, of different categories or different theoretical encounters. Um, pick one or two. Um, you know, maybe we find something, but we can never really communicate with them versus somebody showing up. And what happens to religion? And I know you covered multiple in the book, but let's focus on Christianity. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> wh what happens when we discover this information? Yeah, yeah. So like you say, a big part of it will be um, what kind of discovery is it? So uh, something that was developed years ago is called the Rio scale. And it's basically saying, hey, how big of an impact should this make? And the factors that came into it were, well, is the thing we're detecting like this, you know, weak kind of signal and it's in another galaxy versus, oh, no, we detected the mothership and it's right behind the moon like an Independence Day. Yeah. Um, or the Nazi which moon has, base. like the biggest uh, existential um, connection to yeah. us um and also can we actually have a back and forth so having just like hey our sensors have picked up something very far away versus we can now have two-way communication with an advanced civilization that makes a big difference um and is in terms of impact when it comes to the theological point even in some ways just the demonstration that intelligence exists off earth is something that is going to cause the major religions to have to adapt if not throw up their hands and say whoopsies um some religions will do better than others um surprisingly the mormons they're going to be fine the ufo cults they'll probably be okay um some of the more traditional religions they're they have more explaining to do yeah and, and one of the things that you went into detail which i i thought was absolutely delightful and i know my listeners are going to love this part of the book uh, so of course they're going to get the book aliens and religion mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of other words behind it by <laughs> Jonathan M. S. Pierce and Aaron Adair. Um, but this whole it is it, so funny because when I was reading it, the the insanity that is Christianity, which I, I I think my my line is that Christianity properly understood is paradoxical. Uh, but but then when you talk about other you know aliens and other planets. Uh, and I'm going to prompt you a little bit here, but like if there was a Jesus on earth, let's assume, let's pretend for a moment that actually happened. Uh, does that happen on the home planet of every other alien species? Uh, or does the magic of Jesus dying and killing himself for himself to himself to correct the fuckery that he made before, does that just magically extrapolate 
to the whole universe because we have an omni god that can do anything and everything um discuss i guess because that's that was that was fun but wacky oh yeah yeah and this wackiness is not something that uh, jonathan and i created because uh this has actually been like the major debating point amongst people who call themselves astro theologians yeah uh so these are you know uh trained theologians jesuits or other uh major uh groups within the various uh denominations of christianity or uh, monastic orders and saying hey now if we think about theology in terms of us having uh other creatures that are intelligent just like us and if they're intelligent doesn't that mean they also participate things in like the image of god well how do we fit them into the whole story um do we need to baptize them how does uh, theology and uh, sociology or uh, um a soteriology and everything else work with them. And so, yeah, the biggest sticking point is, well, just how many Jesuses do we need in this universe now? Is it one Jesus to rule them, one Jesus to bind them? Or do you need literally um, the quantum leap version of Jesus where he comes to Earth, gets killed, resurrects, goes off, and then has to reincarnate another body and have to do that over and over again until he's taking care of every single civilization in the universe, which means he's been at this process for billions of years and will continue to be at this process for billions of years as new civilizations come and go. <laughs> and it's just as gig. It's funny because I don't, I don't know if you did it intentionally, but you just, uh, of course, the Lord of the Rings quote, you did intentionally, but you said to bind them where in the book it said to find them. And I was wondering how long did you debate <laughs> on using the word find versus bind in the book or did you just wrote it down and stuck with it? Uh, I know in particular that line comes from Jonathan, so he would be able to answer that question better than I. <laughs> um, and if it ultimately came down to him thinking, like, is there a copyright issue here? I doubt that's the, his thinking, but yeah. uh, uh, he would answer that question better than I. Yeah, and of course, the, and another great uh, nod to uh, science fiction, uh, Jesus, there can be only one. Um, <laughs> and of course, you you guys have, I, I, I lost track, what is it, three, four hundred citations from outside sources something like that and uh and i've also i think i did a good job of also bearing a good number of star trek references so um <laughs> be on the lookout for those i think i got like eight of them all into one sentence yeah, at one but, point but was there singing no you didn't have any singing in your book <laughs> um, as much as i would like to include k-pop and by k i mean klingon pop yeah. i'm unable to perform as well as in that case i know you're referring to the most recent season of uh, star trek strange new worlds <laughs> yes a absolutely uh, i thought it was a joy it's something radically different and it's so funny because i've seen so many people like the plot then uh, the, the the plot on that w wasn't clear uh you know and they had some science wrong and i'm like get over it <laughs> it was a really <laughs> there is sad. no science yeah. where you shoot photon torpedoes at something and it makes people go out into show tunes yeah yeah it, it just doesn't make it, sense. It, it, it so was... it's obviously a premise to just say hey we want to do an episode of buffy the vampire slayer yes. we're gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> it's uh schoolhouse jams or what, what i don't know but they got to get their head in the head in the spaceship um yep. but uh yeah that that whole discussion and uh, like I, I was talking about with all these citations of different and I don't even know if I like the phrase biblical scholars, uh, religious mm -hmm. scholars making up random shit. A and a bunch of them are making up the random shit that, no, you only need one Jesus. Well, what are they basing that on? They're just making it up. And then other ones say, no, you would need a Jesus for each alien species so that they would be able to relate with Jesus being in their form and so Jesus is not just man and God in one, he's man and Vogon in one, right? <laughs> is that, is that how that, that argument was going? Yeah, there are, there are several different ways that have to be approached with this. Yeah. The one, you know, that you know, is the most striking to me is the fact that, Hey, things like the book of Hebrews from the old Testament says, you know, Jesus had to like die once and only once to conquer death. If Jesus has to keep dying over and over and over again, how is that called conquering death if he has to get his ass kicked on every single world? Yeah. Uh, how can you say he's defeated Satan if he has to go and battle Satan uh, a trillion more times? Well, then, of course, are there uh, a trillion different Satans? Because, I mean, that's a lot of angels to fall from the Omni-God, right? I, I, I don't know. Oh, yeah. it, it just becomes – it was it was a fun thought experiment. I'm sure you guys had fun collecting this all. But as I'm reading it, I'm like, if I wasn't already convinced that the whole thing – 
is fiction. When you read it, it's, I mean, this is the beautiful thing about science fiction. You, you take something that is real in, in our culture, society, our planet, whatever, and you put it in a different environment to, to have a different light shining on that problem or opportunity to open your mind and, and look at things different ways. And that's exactly what you guys did in this book. And, and you took your thoughts, your ideas, some calculations, and you took other people's thoughts and ideas. And the whole discussion about whether you have one Jesus or a trillion Jesuses in the universe, and does he die continuously or die only one time? Because if he dies only one time, I would imagine every Christian alive says that he died on our planet. And and how how egotistical is that that we put ourselves right back in the middle of the cosmos again? Because exactly. the one and only one Jesus died here. And, and how do aliens know? And, and of course, you even addressed... What if an alien species wiped itself out more than 2,023 years ago? Are they just fucked? Or <laughs> is there a temporal shift where Jesus, the idea of the one true Jesus applies backwards in time to each civilization around the universe when they're ready for it? Whoa, my head's going to explode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, or even how the idea of sin could possibly work. So if you take the traditional idea that Adam and Eve brought sin into the universe, right. well, again, our basic math suggests more likely than not, there have already been civilizations that have come and gone and died before humanity even existed. So did either they die and never got to even know about the whole Jesus story, or were they somehow even cursed before humanity even mucked things up? It's like, it's almost like the people who wrote the books of the Bible never even had the idea that there were other worlds out there. Yeah, yeah. And, and sometimes you get the impression that they, they didn't know that the world wasn't flat. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. absolutely fascinating. And of course, uh, you guys grabbed lots and lots of biblical quotes. So again, readers, you're going to love it. Uh, using the Bible to fight itself is always one of my favorite hobbies. And you guys did that with... Uh, with some fun and hilarious results. Yeah, yeah. And also some of the um, traditional positions that um, the both Catholics and Protestants had made basically before the modern era when uh, we realized, you know what? There probably are uh, other worlds out there and people on them because uh, an amazing thing that came across was how to reconcile these ideas and going back to like the old theologians, going back to Thomas Aquinas and things like that. And you read the literature and they're saying like, and, you know, there seems to be like, hey, according to this person or that person, we think uh, uh, Catholic or uh, theology is totally compatible with there being other worlds and other civilizations. And uh, another historian of science basically was going through and digging through not just the records of the um, execution of Giordano Bruno in 1600, yeah, I was just thinking but all Bruno. the precedent that that was built up on and realized actually – all the way up to 1600, the position was very clear. No, there are not other worlds. That is a straight up heresy. And that was one of the reasons they burned him at the stake. So saying, oh yeah, Catholic tradition is totally consistent with this versus in 1600, literally murdering people for holding that very position. That's what we would call not uh, consistent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not. And and I'm just looking at the time. I, we're we're well, about 40 minutes in my requested 20 minutes of your time <laughs> and, and we could probably do this for two hours, but I don't want to give up too much of the book. Plus I can smell my dinner is, is ready and, and I want to be respectful of your time, but is there anything else that you want to talk about? Get in, uh, you want to share a web page, mention the book. Uh, if people want to email you and have you come talk at a conference, hit me with some information. All right. All right. Yeah. So again, the book is aliens and religion where two worlds collide we do, of course, do plenty of focus on Christianity, but also Judaism, Islam, uh, Hinduism, Mormonism, UFO cults or uh, religions. Uh, that all goes into our examination and also trying to see if a super advanced civilization did come, what would be like the sociological impact and comparing that to some of the other um, religious movements that happened when more advanced uh, technological uh, entities came along in human history. Um, also, we do a little bit of deep debunking of ancient aliens and things like that yeah, because yep. it needs to be continuously deflated. Um, I will also say, as far as I know, this is the only theology book on the market that actually uses differential equations to come to its positions. Yes. <laughs> uh, my uh, Jonathan did force me to put those into the appendix, but 
Uh, I feel that it gives a level of, uh, I shouldn't say sophistication, because it's not like you need math to necessarily make these arguments good, but trying to show some level of rigor and showing if you're going to do theology, we, everyone should be upping their game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, and, and we, we could probably go a, a good half hour just on the Bayesian analysis, which I'm not going to at this time. Uh, how can people reach you if they want to have you come talk some more? Yeah, yeah. So my main website is Uh Jonathan has a YouTube channel. He actually has a couple different YouTube channels, a Tippling Philosopher and ATP um, Geopolitics. He's been doing especially a lot of coverage on the Ukrainian war. Yeah. Um, Slava Ukraine, I should say. Uh, we also both do publications on the um, uh, site um, Only Sky. Uh, no, we, didn't even, by, we didn't even Dale get McGowan to and, uh yeah. Kind of meta among others uh let's see i had it up I, we had so much fun already uh only sky and the title is congress with aliens excellent <laughs> excellent wordplay there thank you for that yeah uh, yeah U- I, ufo I stories had to write an article up where i could explain some of the how should we put it fuckery that was happening in congress recently yeah yeah i i, I couldn't have said it better uh so everyone can go to only sky the titles congress with aliens question mark ufo story t- return to washington you, go read that one. i'm not even going to talk about that because I, I don't want to take too much of your day um but aaron thank you so much for coming on the phil ferguson show i, I appreciate your time very much thank you very much and it's always a pleasure to be here the phil ferguson show is for educational and entertainment purposes only Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. Thank you once again for listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. If you like the show, there's a couple things you can do to help me out. Uh, Recommend the show to some friends so they can come and listen and learn about all kinds of... uh, investment stuff and maybe some religious stuff we talked about aliens and religion today so that was extra fun so is there only one jesus for the entire universe or does jesus hop around planet to planet in a never-ending loop of sacrificing himself to himself on every alien inhabited world who knows it's all made up anyway it doesn't really matter but it's kind of fun to talk about for a little bit and we had fun today but uh probably not going to think about jesus on other planets much more after today at least i don't think i want to um we talked about a lot of stuff like i said uh i don't know what else to say i'm going to uh three conferences in the next few months uh the first one in canada baja con uh ffrf in madison wisconsin and then i believe it's csi con from uh cfi yeah Center for Inquiry, CSI Con in Vegas a little later in the fall. So we're going to have some fun. I'm going to be out on the road. I hope to see some of you out there. If you do see me, feel free to come up and say hello. Until then, ciao.
There's a girl at the bar, wants to get me by the 